Hi, this is Brennan Marilla. I'm the uh, Chief Commercial and Operating Officer for Osseo, and I am joined today by uh, Dr. Mark Preisel. Uh, Dr. Preisel is a fellowship-trained foot and ankle surgeon at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center in Columbus, Ohio, which is the largest multidisciplinary foot and ankle practice in the United States. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. Mark, uh, let's start off by asking you, uh, how you're doing right now, um, personally, professionally, how are you dealing with the situation and um, would love to hear how you're managing the business of your practice. Yeah, uh, well, it's obviously been an interesting and unprecedented time for all of us and we're all uh, kind of navigating this day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And uh, we're all learning as we go through this and uh, what we're doing uh, collectively is learning together. I think everybody from different portions of, of the industry and different portions of our profession are kind of coming together to try to figure out what the right strategies and solutions are uh, to continue to be solvent and to ultimately uh, thrive while still providing good patient care. On the professional side for us within our practice, uh, so Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center here in Columbus, we have 12 providers in our group. We have five partner physicians, two employed physicians, uh, three physician assistants, and then we train two fellows uh, a year as well. And so among all of us, we've been hyper communicating is what I would say that we've been doing. When we normally have one business meeting a month where the partners get together, we've been doing that actually on a weekly basis right now. And among us all, we're having side conversations pretty much on a daily basis with our executive director. And I think that's what's really initially presented itself as a huge challenge, but has been part of our uh, early success in being able to navigate this process is just being very transparent and, and communicating with each other. And so we've really kind of had to strip down our business model and think about what really is, is critical um, and what really needs to be focused on right now. And we've had some success in doing that. We've been able to this point to not have to lay off any of our employees, which is really important to us. And we're able to keep our doors open and still uh, able to provide patient care, especially for those emergent and urgent issues. We also treat a lot of people that we've either operated on over the last few months that still need care or people that just generally need to be seen regularly uh, for whatever their condition may be. So we're just trying to be available for those people as much as we can. Yeah. Have you had to come up with any creative solutions for engaging and following up with your patients? You know, I think, yeah, I think the big thing that everybody's been incorporating and what's really blown up over the past few weeks to month is telehealth. And that's something that we've incorporated into our practice as well. Um, and uh, the insurance industry has reduced some of the stringency with what qualifies for those types of visits, which has allowed uh, healthcare providers in general to be able to gain access to their patients. Patients have been really uh, positively embracing that as a solution, and they've been very patient with us as we've kind of went through the learning curve about how to, how to best tackle that and achieve best practices um, within, within our strategy of how we can do that. Um, so that's one thing that we've been doing. Uh, we've also been trying to triage patients and try to understand who really needs to be seen, who wants to be seen, and who can we safely see. And if there's somebody that we can't safely see within the, the confines of our office, we need to figure out an alternate solution for them. They still deserve care, they still need care. And so that's really where telehealth comes in and where it's, where it's been an access point for us to continue to engage and communicate uh, with our patients, make sure everybody's doing well and is safe and that we're providing as good of care as we can. Any, any tips or tricks you can share on how to do an appropriate patient consult over video? You know, what tools are you using? Are there any uh, particular techniques that are helping? Um, you know, I mean, one thing is to be very, I guess, clear in your language. Uh, how you interact with somebody face-to-face -face isn't always necessarily the same. How you're describing something may need to change a little bit. Um, and the other thing that's important is they have to understand that it is a healthcare visit. It's just like they're in the doctor's office when they're going through that. And so that's, that's the expectation from the doctor to patient, and that should be the expectation from the patient to doctor. Uh, the patient needs the opportunity to speak to. I think that's one challenge is uh, you, you, put a, you put a video in front of us and you turn on the camera and uh, the doctor just wants to talk. Uh, it's really our opportunity to listen though. And it's probably more important now than ever that we're listening to our patients and we're making sure that all of their concerns are appropriately addressed and that their questions are appropriately answered. And the only way that we're gonna do that is if we're giving the patient a chance to talk as well. So I, I guess that'd be one thing that I would say to people if they're just getting into telehealth is as the provider, don't feel like you're the one that has to necessarily lead the entire conversation. You wanna make sure your patient concerns are fully addressed as well. Has this changed how you'll manage your practice moving forward when life gets back to, I would say, semi-normal? 
Yeah, well, I think uh, I think you're you're spot on there. We're a little ways from normal. We'll probably hit semi-normal, uh, hopefully before we uh, before too long, and then someday we'll maybe get back to normal. That's ultimately the goal, um, you know. And I think when we get a normal, it'll be a new normal too. I think that there will be some changes uh, to how healthcare is delivered and uh, what expectations are set with regard to healthcare as well. Um, you know, the telehealth piece of it is, is still a little bit of a variable, whether that's something that's going to be able to be continued afterward. Right now, CMS has uh, loosened some of the restrictions and restraints on what types of visits we can do, who we can do those visits with, and the commercial payers have largely followed CMS's lead. Um, so that's what's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next several months, even into the next few years, is whether CMS and the private insurance industry find value in uh, doctors being able to communicate with their patients uh, via virtual means or if they retighten some of those restrictions that were previously there. Um, ultimately, I think for a practice like ours, and every day we see patients from several hours away. And so they drive a few hours to see us, they spend some time with us, and then they drive a few hours home. And so for us, um, it would I, I think that there would be an advantage if we could have the ability uh, for patient convenience, if we can provide the same quality and level of care for certain select visits, that we could continue to use something like telehealth on a broader scale, that, that may uh, make, make some sense. And there may be uh, some cases, especially for unique technologies, where to figure out if a patient is a candidate for it or not, or some sort of screening before a patient's gonna drive X number of hours for expert level care, to see if they'd really be wasting their time or if it's an appropriate screening mechanism for centers of excellence and things like that to see if, if that level of care or that particular procedure or whatever they may be looking for outside of just our practice, but in, in, um, in healthcare in general to see if you'd be a candidate for something. So there may be some interesting things that can come out of this. I think a lot of it's gonna be wrapped around what can be done with telehealth. Um, the other thing is how patients interact when they're in an office and how office flows work. I, I think it's a while before we're gonna get back to normal of being able to see our, our maximal val, uh, volume of patients where we're, we're really creating an efficient office environment. And so we'll have to figure out some strategies to optimize and maintain our efficiencies and figure out how we can best use our staff at our facilities while maximizing you know, some of the safety parameters around what's likely gonna be a continued social distancing environment for an unknown period of time. In addition to what you've already shared with us, are there any other practical tips or lessons that you would share with your peers around the country? Yeah, you know, I mean, my perspective on that, I would say even over the past few weeks has changed. Um, when, it, when we were first in the middle of this, you know, I felt there was more of an urgency to it than I do now. I mean, now I feel like we're in the middle of it. We need to be patient, we need to be safe, and we need to figure out the right strategy to be strong on the other side. And the first few days after, you know, we all started learning about this, you know, it, it's, it was a little easier to be panicked. And I, I think that's what I would encourage people is don't panic, be patient, try to be strategic about this, understand with challenge, usually comes some opportunity. And it's a matter of how you're going to digest this information and digest this challenge that we're in the middle of about ultimately how you're going to thrive on the backside of this and how you're going to come out stronger. Um, I think this gives us some time to pause and be introspective with ourselves and our practices, try to identify where there are inefficiencies in what we're doing, and try to streamline our processes and just make ourselves better. And so in my own mind and in my own practice, I'm trying to look at everything that I do and be uh, analytic of myself so that I can try to figure out how to optimize any efficiencies or any inefficiencies that I currently have to you know, evolve them into a more efficient process on the backside so that I'm able to better provide better care for a larger number of people uh, safely, you know, at that point. So I think that's what we really have the, the opportunity to do is figure out what can we do better. So uh, you were the first surgeon in the United States to use osteofiber, uh, hammer to yes. implant. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, companies like ours, what can we be doing to support our surgeons? And then in terms of the osteofiber technology, how can that make a difference in practice moving forward? Yeah, so I think when we come out of this, we're going to see some really interesting things. And it's going to happen at different times at different points in the country. And I think one of the challenges uh, is how hospital systems are going to handle moving back toward elective surgery. And I see a couple obstacles with that. Uh, one obstacle I see is that there are going to be concerns with regards to sterility and where things have been. And so hospitals may have some opposition to having loaner trays 
coming into their facilities, not knowing which states they've been to before. And so I think companies that are established on uh, technologies which allow for a single use instrumentation, uh, sterile processing, pre-processed things that don't require SPD, um, I think that there's potentially going to be uh, some opportunity uh, for companies who have those types of technologies to penetrate the market a little bit more heavily. Um, I could see a situation where, you know, hospital systems, uh, a lot of what drives the economics of the hospitals are elective surgery. And if a hospital has been stripped down of that for two months, as they come back into uh, the world of elective surgery and they need to strategize how to do that, there are going to be higher revenue cases that they may be looking to do. Total joints, for example, uh, it's well known that those are, are uh, high revenue cases for hospitals and ultimately a lot of what props hospitals up and funds hospitals and health systems. And so if we're looking at you know, needing to get back to elective surgeries and there is a, a pecking order in terms of which cases hospitals are going to allow when, um, th those cases that are going to be high revenue may be coming back more quickly to help prop the hospital up from an economic standpoint. And those, so we may see a, an influx of those types of cases, which are typically very heavy on SPD. And so if I'm trying to do a foot and ankle case, my trays may not get processed until, you know, the, the four rooms that are doing total joints that each have, you know, six cases in each room that each have six trays for each case, you know, and all of a sudden we have an SPD backlog. And so I think that there's a lot of different things that potentially could come out of this. But what I think, you know, where we'll start to see some differentiation in the market here is that companies that, you know, aren't going to be heavy on SPD with their product lines and companies that do have applications for single use, uh, sterile implants and instruments, there's some value to that because it takes out some of the questions and it takes out some of the equipment and processing and cost um, that's going to be associated with the cases. And I see that happening both on the outpatient market and the ASC side as well as the hospital market, the timing of where, which one happens at which point may just be a little bit different based on how this happens. Yeah, and uh, hopefully if we can, uh, if, if osteofiber technology can avoid hardware removal surgeries, yeah. you, then, know that, uh, you could do more profitable cases versus uh, you know, hardware removal. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. And that's, I think, where, where technology um, you know, really makes a difference and where you know, one can make an argument for how to define value how to define value in surgery and uh, going to the OR is not a cheap endeavor. And so you're exactly right. Um, you know, if you have a biointegrative technology where within 18 months to two years that, that implant has essentially served its purpose and is no longer there because it doesn't need to be there. That's what I always tell people when I use titanium is that it's intended to be permanent. Sometimes we need to remove it. But if I take an x-ray 20 years from now and I've put a titanium implant and nobody's taking it out, it's still going to be there. You know, it's still, there's a chance that something's going to have to happen to it. With an osteofiber-like technology, this bio-integrative technology, I know what the timeline is. There's science to support the timeline of when that implant is going to be there and when that implant is going to be gone. And the nice thing about it is there's no burst effect. It's not all of a sudden one day it's there and the next day it's not. It's a gentle degradation over time, which ultimately should be very safe for the patient. All great thoughts. Thank you for your advice and, 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 uh, and your guidance. I have one last question for you, which is, what have you learned about yourself during this stay at home period so far? Yeah, what I'm, what I'm learning about myself is that I, I, I need to take my own advice. I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying not to panic. I'm trying to stay positive, uh, enjoying the time with my family. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm learning about myself is I really want to make sure that uh, I'm surrounding myself with good people too. And that's one thing uh, that I've really been, been proud of. I'm learning a lot from my team, uh, the surgeons I work with, the partners I have. Um, I think that we all have a lot to be grateful for. And that's what I'm trying to do is be somewhat uh, uh, introspective of what's happening at this time and realize, you know, that we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be grateful for. Um, we have a lot of smart people helping us try to navigate through these situations and everybody's trying to do the best they can. And I think we're all just ready to get past this, get back to our new normal or our, our, our sort of normal and uh, get back to helping as many people as we can. Great talk. Thank you, Dr. Preisel. We appreciate your, your feedback and uh, we uh, wish you the best of luck and please stay healthy. Thank you. It's my pleasure.